Good afternoon and welcome to the Better, Bolder, Braver Marketing Masterclass. Uh, my name is Frances Khalasji and I'm joined today by none other than my father, Stephen Fogel. Uh, Simon is away this week in uh, Copenhagen and so I thought I'd take this opportunity to uh, invite a guest that was a very personal connection to me on the show. So welcome, Dad. And thank you, Rudy, for letting us know that we sound OK. I hope Dad does too. Um, thank you all. I have posted in the chat that we would love to know where you are listening in from and what your various work hats are, if there's more than one. And welcome, Natalie. Thank you for letting us know where you are. Um, I am going to assume that you are a friend of my dad's because I can see that you are from the legal world. Um, so thank you for being here. Hi, Carlos. Hi, Yvonne. Lovely to have some Better World Braver community members here as well. Um, I, I hope that some of you have had an opportunity to see the article that my dad has uh, written about his work-work balance. Um, I approached dad to be on the Marketing Masterclass because something has become um, quite a central point of interest to me, and that is not the concept of work, uh, work life balance for coaches, but the concept of work work balance. And that's because Simon and I were seeing that there was a bit of a what we thought toxic narrative around coming out of coaching training and, and sort of being given the uh, idea that you could do nothing other than coaching from then on. And of course, bills need to be paid. And sometimes it isn't healthy to do just one thing all the time, particularly if you haven't done it before and you are um, transitioning out of something else in life. And in the Better Bold Braver community, we are trying to provide a space for people to be honest with themselves and each other and be inspired by each other to create a business for themselves that is sustainable. And hence the concept of work, work balance came about the idea that you might do coaching and something else at the same time. And not only does that help pay the bills, but actually feels good in terms of your energy balance, but also can really contribute to the story that you tell about why you have empathy, authority and experience enough to coach the people that are your ideal clients. So that's the context. I could only think of one person that I thought was a brilliant uh, example of this work work balance thing. And that was my dad to bring on the show and talk about what I am talking about. Uh, so welcome, Dad. I thought we would just kick off by perhaps uh, talking a little bit around uh, the definition of work-work balance, um, because in the article that you wrote about your life, you talk about the balance within a job. Um, and of course, what I was coming at was having a number of jobs. Um, if we can go backwards in your life, uh, I think that would be a great way to kick things off. Would you share with everyone here um, what is your work work balance right now? So what are the various hats that you are wearing right now? And maybe what does a typical week look like for you right now? I think that's a good place to start. Well, um, you did say before that you wanted a definition and lawyers love definitions. So they're most comfortable if they begin by providing a definition. You know, we live in a, an Alice in Wonderland world where words are what we say they're going to mean. So when we draft a document, we set out all the definitions and then we're in our own little world. So I'll, I'll start um, by defining what I mean by work work balance and then say what I'm doing at the moment. Um, it's two things, really, Francis. The first thing is the balance that you achieve in the one job you're doing. So if you're doing one job, which I was doing uh, for more than 40 years of my life, the thing to try to do um, within the context of that job is to try to take on as many different roles as you can. Now, um, this really means fighting for it, asking um, to do different tasks, volunteering to do things, but making sure that there's balance. 
And um, it's really a matter of getting agency yourself in what you do. Agency is a modern word, meaning the ability to define your own life. And that's really what I'm encouraging people to do. When I when I left the law firm, which was in 2012, well, I'd already started dabbling a bit with other jobs. Uh, and then I became a full time, uh, I think um, it's called a portfolio worker. So now I have a whole number of different jobs and I try to achieve a balance within that work. The main balance is between working in business on the one hand and in the arts on the other. And the other balance is between doing things um, uh, that are paid and paid reasonably well and doing things that are not paid, that um, are pro bono and really a matter of, you know, putting something back in. Um, so what am I doing at the moment? Should I go on to that? Or is there something you'd like to question me on on what I've just said? So um, I don't know whether you can hear me, but suddenly um, we blocked out. Sorry, that's my fault. I was muted. Can everyone hear? Can everyone hear Dad? All right, though, because Dad hasn't got a mic. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, and now Dad's reconnecting. <laughs> Probably thought it was uh, his. So it might happen but again. It may be some. Sorry, Dad. Um, uh i i couldn't see you there it was my fault i was muted yeah um and everyone can hear you that's fine yeah um so i was going to go on and talk about the sorts of things i'm doing at the moment but did you want to ask me something about that work work balance no i think we should hear where you are now okay um well the paid jobs are first that um i chair a company called sparrows capital which looks after other people's money, their investment managers. And we do it in um, what was a unique way when we started. It was really a, a crusade to change the way money was managed. Um, normally, what people do when they manage your money is that they tell you that um, they can, uh, that they have a special genius that enables them to sell and buy shares uh, that are going to be very valuable. So they time the market, they choose the stocks. And um, I had the experience when I was working at London University of being with uh, a very eminent professor who said, look, this is nonsense. If you look back over 100 years, people who try to time the market, um, very few of them do well. So what you should do is you should buy the whole of the market. You should buy what's called index shares and that's what we do it was unique when we started about 10 years ago and we're now doing quite well and we're just at the moment in our first round of financing from external people um, that's to say outside the people working in the business and that's going quite well but it's taking up a lot of my time so that's Barrow's capital then um, I look after a very wealthy family which works together with many other families and invests principally in the United States uh, in property and in private equity. And that's a great job um, because it takes me all around the world, but particularly in the United States, it's very interesting. And um, I like the people involved in it, even though I have um, socially democratic instincts. Um, on this occasion, I do represent um, pretty wealthy people. But I should say that in the Sparrows context, we cap the fees so that we're open really to everybody. Then the third job, um, the third paid job is in the music world. I'm on the board of a company called Harrison Parrott. Harrison Parrott um, manages the careers of musicians all over the world. It moves orchestras around, conductors, singers, and it has various divisions, one dealing with classical music and the other dealing with classical musicians uh, sorry, pop musicians who have moved over to classical and want to use um, orchestras in a different way. So, for example, Stuart Copeland of the police and people like that. And it's a fascinating job. And um, what I'm doing in that job arises out of my first non-paid job, 
which is moving a dance company around the world. So I'm on the board of Harrison Parrot. That's a trustee job. Um, but I learned something about logistics in the music business. And um, so that sort of helped me when I applied to join Harrison Parrot. And also, um, your two brothers are in the music industry. One is a jazz musician and the other is a music producer. So I had an appetite listening to what they could teach me. So those are the paid jobs. Um, the first unpaid job is uh, Hoffer Schechter, the dance company. Um, and then I've been involved in various other not-for-profit activities um, over the years, as usually one project or another on, including things I do for myself, like filmmaking or gardening and that sort of thing. So lots of work, work balance to the point where things don't seem like work anymore, but they seem like enjoyable play. Do you, do you remember, like, do you think about um, what you're getting paid when you're working or has it all kind of got to this point where like do you do you wear a hat that says this is a paid job and this is a not paid job and does that affect the energy that you bring to the work um i completely forget about the money side um once i start a job i look after myself when i negotiate a new contract um so i make sure that i'm being paid the market rate and that um at some stage or another, um, what I'm paid is going to be looked at once again. Um, I normally uh, negotiate very loosely. So one of the things I did when I was in legal practice was that when it came to put in a bill, I'd often say to the client, well, what do you think this is worth? And I thought that was a very good technique. Um, and so that's really pretty well what I do now. And if people are on the low side, I would tell them that. But, you know, be completely um, um, relaxed about the whole thing and then come and look at pay um, some later time during the contract. But being very sensitive about the financial position of the company. Um, so in one case, I've actually foregone salary um, because the company um, hit, had hit a cash flow difficulty. Um, and I trusted that that would be um, rectified at the right time. I don't think um, about money when I'm working. Thank you. Okay, I'm interested in the story that you're telling on retrospect because that's really key to what we work on in my community. Uh, you know, I talk a lot about myself having had what I like to call a squiggly career. I really like that phrase um, from the squiggly career ladies out there um, because, you know, it allows me to make sense for myself uh of what on earth has happened in my life which at the time didn't seem to make a lot of sense uh but now i can say with conviction that all of it did and it speaks very much to where i am now what i'm doing so the the the, the skill of storytelling is uh paramount for me in my own sense of my own worth and understanding of my life but I think it's also really valuable when you're telling the story to others as to where you are now. And I'm interested in to what degree you're conscious of telling a story here and now, uh, but every day to yourself um, and to us as your family and to others, for example, in a job interview um, as to where you've ended up and, and sort of why you're doing all of the things. And also connected to that, do you consciously make decisions about adding things into the portfolio or do you find that things organically add themselves in uh, and then you can make sense of why they make sense right that's kind of a double-edged question a double double question yes okay well starting with the last point um i do think quite consciously about having balance in my life and it follows from that um, that there should be balance in the work I do. So when a job ends, and I've had um, a couple of jobs which have ended, I think about what a suitable replacement would be. And I think about strategy for myself in the same way as I do uh, for the companies and organisations for which I work. So the lesson from that is to take a strategic approach to your own career. And one of the biggest aspects of that is to decide the moment, if it comes, when you should move on. And I decided uh, that I should definitely move on 
from being a lawyer, that that would be good for me. But, um, you know, that can be a pretty um, difficult decision. And for many people, it's a very courageous decision to abandon um, a full time career. Then as to the first part of the question, talking to other people. Um, so I informally do do, I wouldn't call it coaching work, but more mentoring work. You know, I have spent time with um, people who are younger than me um, talking about the management of careers and, you know, trying to emphasize that what's worked for me isn't necessarily going to work for everybody. Maybe it works for me because I'm a bit of a butterfly. Um, what did you, what was the expression you used at the very beginning to describe your movement? It wasn't um, corkscrew movement. What did yeah, you say? Yeah, squiggly career. There's a, a squiggly career, yeah. You run something called the yeah. squiggly career. Well, they now call it amazing if, but it was, they came up with the concept of squiggly career. Sarah Ellis, and I can't remember her business partner, but they came up with the idea of the squiggly career that obviously, but uh, that's fine. Mm. It's basically the well, maybe that's, you know, something embedded in our respective personalities that we both have that taste and, um, you know, there's a need to respect the fact that um, other people have um, a great need for security um, and that there's a huge fear factor about trying the unknown. And so really the thing to do, and I'm sure that this is especially true of the coaches um, that you're working with, um, is to try to get a really good feel for the personality and what would suit that personality and their appetite for risk. In fact, we've got a question here from Carlos, which is, are you happy, Dad, to share any key or core beliefs or values that inform the basis of your work strategy? Are you conscious of there being any key or core beliefs or values that you now understand are central to your decisions about your work work balance? Mm. Um, I think the most important thing is to act ethically. I'll tell you a very quick story about that. Um, one of my mentors, and Natalie will know this um, on, the, on the call, um, was a man called Charles Corman. Charles Corman was a very prominent city solicitor, and he was one of two people who influenced me um, to join the law firm that I joined in the 1970s. The other one was a, um, a man called Michael Max. And... Um, Charles attracted very eminent clients across the city. Charles died after a um, relatively short illness. He died um, a few weeks ago and um, he had a memorial service held for him. And um, the first speaker was uh, Michael Heseltine, the politician who'd been a client of Charles throughout his life. Um, and Michael Heseltine said, at the memorial service that the thing about Charles was that he not only advised you what the law was but he then told you what the best moral position was. Now that's very very difficult uh, for a lawyer to find the authority to do or anybody a businessman or a coach for anybody to do that because you don't want to be self-righteous with the client but somehow um, you need to find a way of discerning what is um, the right ethical position. And I try to think about that in my work. And sometimes when people do things that I wouldn't necessarily do, I try to find my voice uh, to point out that this is perhaps not the right way. So I just make it very simple and stick to that one point, remembering your ethical position. It's really interesting to hear you say that, Dad, because, you know, I've been understanding myself so much better in the last year and a half. And one of the things that I've realised in my experiences uh, over the years is that, you know, I'm a bit of a whistleblower myself and that has caused me some grief in moments in jobs, um, but it's something that I kind of stand by. And also as a, I, I've said this this morning actually on the call, but as a short female Jewish marketing girl, you know, I've had to stand my corner sometimes <laughs> and, and sort of shout quite loudly or clearly to be heard. Um, so it's interesting because I think, well, maybe that's also something I've inherited from you as well. Um, and I, I wonder if on that point, um, and I do want to come back to your question, John Paul, and, and please, everyone listening in, if you do have any comments or questions or something that you'd like to share in the chat, please do. That's wonderful to have you part of this discussion. 
Um, I just before we go to John Paul's question, want to revisit something that you mentioned earlier, which was your social democratic in instincts, as I think the phrase you used. So I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more about that ethical stance and, mm -hmm. you know, how it has in some moments perhaps compromised work that you've done not not necessarily specifically if you don't feel comfortable going into any particular situation but just say a little bit more about that and and also how having this work work balance has allowed you to be an agent of change as i like to say uh more than if you'd been stuck in one job let's say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well um first um social democracy is really a political position um it's a position which would define you, um, depending upon your perspective, either as being in the centre of politics or the left of centre politically. But um, uh, it's actually you've actually given me a cue to make an important distinction between um, disliking people's politics and disliking their ethical stand. And for me, the two things are definitely not related, although for some people they are. Now, there are some areas where they might be related. So, for example, I'd be very uncomfortable representing climate deniers or working for people who were doing things which um, quite plainly spoiled um, our planet, the environment. On the other hand, I am used to working with people who take a very different political position to me. For example, in one of my jobs, I seem to be surrounded by um, Brexiteers and Trumpists, so that whenever I go to America, I'm absolutely bemused by the fact that the people I meet, or at least um, was meeting um, when Trump was still president, um, found good words for him and supported him. And I would try to get into as reasonable um, a discussion as I could without spoiling the you know business relationship I have with them, and without raising the temperature. So that's always a challenge, keeping your cool when you don't agree with people um, politically. So there's a real distinction between your political position, which you want to try and navigate calmly, and your ethical position. On your ethical position, there might be um, a political attitude, which was so opposed to yours, that it actually traverses the ethical line. And I think that the environment is one of those and also um, um, a certain um, uh, nationalist and racist streak would be another. I couldn't possibly work with people um, who took that stand. But I'm not going to get into a detailed um, account of social democracy um, because, you know, that's for another discussion. <laughs> I, I always love listening to you, Dad, uh, talking about politics so you know feel free um although this is not a political show so <laughs> uh but i don't really i don't you know I'm, i don't need to edit what is coming through this channel because uh it's about showing people for who they are so i'm in whatever you, you want. might you might yeah. want to refer to our very vigorous debates on a friday night with a certain uncle who takes a very different position to me on um uh matters and um uh well i'll just leave it at that <laughs> okay um what i'm wondering is can we maybe just kind of zoom in a bit more in, in terms of your own personal values um so what have you felt compromised by that perhaps inform that decision to tran to kind of transition out of full-time corporate work into a more rainbow life Mm. Um, well, there's John Paul's question, yes, which um, thank I definitely you. And want that's, to take. That's related, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very interesting question. First, um, you know, Woody Allen, um, uh, who I like to say was a great writer before a comedian, he was once asked what his values were. And he said, well, look, I'm going to tell you what my parents' values were. Yeah, what were they? God and carpeting. Um well, my values are not God and carpeting, but um, in answer to Jean-Paul, um, the warning signs, um, I did have a job from 2012 onwards um, with a law firm uh, that went bust. And I think I saw the warning signs before that happened. Um, I resigned just before the very end. It wasn't the, the law firm that I'd grown up with, but I think the reason they recruited me 
uh, was because I had an experience, you know, being a managing partner uh, and a senior partner of a law firm. Um, and the first thing I noticed when I walked into their building was how lavish it was. It was absolutely unbelievable. And there were enormous amounts of space for um, uh, for the clients. And it really um, um, was the equivalent of having a corporate jet. You know, they say that when a company has got a corporate jet, you know that it's going to go bust. And so the first thing I did was to talk to them about the better use of space. And they did actually um, follow that advice and they started subletting space. By the way, I was a non-executive there rather than an executive, which I am for all the organizations I work for. I'm not an executive anywhere. I'm always a non-executive, which means that you're trying to give an objective view and that you hope to be listened to. And there were many things on which I was not listened to. Um, some of these things were detailed matters of uh, the way an organization is run. And um, but the main thing is that the partners were all fighting with one another. This firm had come from a tradition where it was a new firm in the 1980s and um, it hadn't had decades for the partners really to mesh with one another. So you had the impression that even against their better judgment, they just couldn't help it. They were competing with one another all the time. Well, that worked for a time when the firm was doing well, but when it hit a bad patch, um, things went terribly wrong. And what that firm had done was it had um, snatched all of its partners from other firms and paid them a bit more. And suddenly, when things went wrong, other firms started feeding on them. And the firm went downhill very, very quickly. So um, I don't know whether that really answers John it was Paul's more, question. It, it's interesting because on the one hand, you're still, if I may say, still quite hot uh there's something there's an energy there let's say around that whole time for you still I'm imagine because you allowed yourself to go down that rabbit hole when you were trying to answer John Paul's question which is what are the warning signs that things aren't yeah. working and you did answer that question but I couldn't help but notice that you also um I, th I think what I'm trying to speak to is if you know burnout isn't just something that happens in the moment but it can it can you know it's something that can affect you for for a number of years you know we're still reeling from things that happened because we were yeah I'm going to interrupt you there because I didn't really answer John Paul's question about burnout you're right um and the answer is that I've been burnt out at times there have been pe periods two years here a year there where I felt burnt out and I felt um, completely burnt out in 2012 when I left my former law firm. Um, and I actually had to go away and take myself on a sabbatical, which I did. I, I traveled, as you remember, quite extensively um, in Australia. And then a few years later, I hit a, um, a difficult patch once again when the law firm that I've referred to before was starting to go downhill. And I spent some interesting time traveling in china so there have been periods of burnout <laughs> i'm laughing um, about the um no pork thing do you want to tell that story i don't know why um, it's funny <laughs> uh, uh, no you tell the story what did i tell you at the time well i hope that the story is what actually happened but this is what mm -hmm. i remember so dad had i was in china but it was on a work trip right i think it started as a work trip and then i went off and took some time off to travel in the hinterland of China, uh, going on trains and going to very remote places and getting away from the party. One thing I should say uh, was that the party wasn't so much um, the party in the party party sense. And there was a party where I played my guitar and did a, a Bob Dylan impression. Um, George, who is a musician, my middle son, joined and backed me. Um, on the piano and we played to lots and lots of wildly enthusiastic Chinese people <laughs> but the thing about that was that the party the communist party was everywhere um, so that we saw these strange officials attending our meetings and our gatherings that was very strange but when I went out into the countryside um, to strange places where the food was even odder very very difficult for me to understand and digest the food um, I, I may there have come across a pork problem as a non-pork eater what did you have in mind yeah yeah and so I think if I'm not wrong uh you had you put a sign around your neck in Chinese because you were finding it difficult to communicate that you didn't eat pork correct mm. Mm. 
Mm. And so yes. people got to know you as Mr. No Pork. Mr. No Pork. Because <laughs> yes. that's what you had written on your on your side. Yes. Your yes. Yeah, no. People do find that funny. Um, uh, last year, um, your mum and I went to a restaurant where um, they don't tell you what they're going to give you and there's no menu in advance. Um, but they say, do you have any uh, allergies? And I said, well, I actually don't eat pork. <laughs> and uh, we turned up and they gave me ants. Um, which I did eat. <laughs> uh, they had got ants from the forest and they were actually delicious. Um, as you know, I sent you the photographs. But anyway, we jest. Let no, us get I, I like this diversion because you also remind me, and another thing that I'm learning about myself, is how much space and travel and independence is really important to me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm creating in my own life where I have two children under five and I run a business, um, also some space, as you know, for myself. And I take myself off and I did do when I was younger as well. And I didn't really realize that it was, I thought, you know, it was just par of the course. I went away on my own for 13 months. Um, mm. And, you know, I just thought I was like any other middle-class twat going backpacking, but I now realize that, you know, actually it was a bit of a, it wasn't just a rite of pas passage. It was an important thing for me to do. Mm. And I'd forgotten all about your Australia trip. How long, and how, and it's interesting for me as a child, of yours because I'm a bit obsessed with what my children are going to be talking about in therapy in 30 years time mm. and I can't put a foot wrong otherwise I'll fuck their lives up but um you know I'm thinking god dad went to Australia for quite a few weeks right and I've completely mm. forgotten mm. the whole thing that was Didn't five think? weeks and I had been traveling in strange parts of America for six weeks uh, that's the first time I did it uh, again I had a sort of mini burnout um in about 2008 um, and I was feeling not great physically. I'd had a hip operation and one or two things like that. And so I was able to take myself off at that time. Um, so that was the first time. It's really been three times, one America for six weeks, then Australia and um, also Tasmania for five weeks, including doing some amazing diving in the coral reefs, because you know my great passion in life is swimming every day. Tell us, and, bit, tell us just briefly about the swimming because you didn't mention it or the guitar playing oh right okay um well um when i had my hip operation somebody told me that a great way to recover was by swimming so um i went to uh, a private pool with a view to joining it it's a pool where children can't swim during the week that's why it's worth paying for it because you get a lane there you're pretty well guaranteed to get a lane and I saw this guy um, called Stephen Shaw swimming butterfly in the most elegant way. So I think I must have had a homoerotic moment as I watched him politically moving through the water. And I asked him to teach me, which he did. And I became more and more enthusiastic about his method, which is Alexander technique in the swimming pool. So that's the style I use. I'm pretty passionate about it. I taught a number of people um, to swim pro bono um since then and one thing that i'm particularly passionate about is long distance butterfly which in my case means about a mile and a half but in stephen shaw's case is five miles very very impressive you just swim um uh rather more slowly than the lunatics you see doing butterfly in swimming pools where they just do one or two lengths and you tried it francis and i thought you did it pretty well although you didn't keep it up but I, I do swim every day. I do swim occasionally. It's just not my sport of choice. But we did, mm. we did go in a, we did, because you, you've not mentioned wild swimming yet. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you, that expression wild swimming's become a bit of a cliche. <laughs> so, you know, people have, um, they, they imagine that you're going up to the coldest parts of the planet um, and, or, or that you're going completely wild. I mean, in my case, what it mainly means is um, finding uh, a lake somewhere. So I claim to be the first human to have swum across Lake Lugano um, doing butterfly, which I did with your mum behind in a boat to make sure I didn't collapse um, and to take me back from the other side. Um, where's Lake, just for everyone, mm, where's Lake Lugano? Mm, Daddy, uh, where's, Lake where's Lake Lugano? Uh, it's on the border of uh, Switzerland and Italy. Right. Um, and uh, was that the one that I, used that to I, do... came, I came with you that time? Was that a different time? That's a different time. And then I did a swimming blog for a while, which was heading, headed, I think it's headed. Yeah, my swimming blog from Australia was headed swimming with crocs. 
which didn't mean crocodiles, but it meant the shoes that got me down to the edge of the pool at the time. But the other thing to say about swimming, in case anybody um, um, is thinking of constructing a life where they build a swim in every day, is that I'm also passionate about music. And I listen to music underwater using bone conduction. So I've got these headphones that sit on the cheek and they somehow turn the body into an amplifier. And so I can listen to a concert every day under the water, which is wonderful. And tell tell everyone what happened when you were invited to write a blog for the company that produced uh, the special headphone things. Oh, I don't remember that. You'll have to remind me. So they're called Swim P3s, correct? Mm -hmm. And you wrote, That's correct. You, you loved them so much. You were such a big cheerleader that you wrote, didn't you write a review that got published? Oh, yes, yes, yes. If anybody wants to get free stuff, one thing to do is to write a review because they kept on sending me free stuff for years afterwards. So I got a constant supply of um, swim P3s, as they were known at the time. So yeah, you're, no, you're um, an early influencer. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, yeah. I Before the expression influencer. Uh, became known I did um, uh, I did champion the brand I, I guess people here are now getting a little bit more of an insight into why I am the way I am <laughs> and who I inherited a lot of it from uh, we've got Bombers. another question here from the lovely mm. Kieran um, I also just want to park so that we don't forget because I love the rabbit holes we're going down you spoke of homoerotic mm -hmm. moments so in a moment I want you to tell us about the play and acting as well and maybe you can tell us about Venice Biennale just to chuck that in because that's a funny one. Okay. Um, so wait, K Kieran's saying, just let's let's read the question out so that we don't forget about it. I would love to hear more about the creative, expressive outputs you spoke to in your article. Oh look, I just said that. The filmmaking, acting, radio play, gardening are these new parts mm. or ones that have become unearthed as your work work balance has shifted what a lovely question kieran thank you so much mm. um yeah thank you i mean that's a, a great one to bowl at me so part of this work work philosophy is to um is to keep on trying to do different things different creative things as much as i can um and just to try and elbow my way into that world. So first one you mentioned was the, yeah, so the three things, yeah, the acting, um, the uh, the filmmaking uh, and, and um, uh, the gardening. So on the acting, um, every year there's a group of lawyers who um, are allowed to take over a London theatre for a week or two and put on a play with um, with a legal aspect. And for many, many years, they put on this play at the then known as Tricycle Theatre, which became known as the Kiln Theatre. Um, but there was a falling out, and so they moved to a theatre in Highgate called the Gatehouse. Anyway, um, they had a barrister who was going to be in a play, and he hit um, a big trial, which meant that he couldn't uh, act in it. So I was asked to appear in a John Mortimer play called Naked Justice, and I was going to be... Um, a fraudulent gay accountant um, who basically messed everybody up. I thought, yeah, that's an interesting part. And it was quite a large part in the play. Um, and the thrill of it was that by then, the lawyers had started mixing with professional actors and directors. So I got the advantage for my first big role uh, of working against um, a rather good uh, professional actress and um, a professional director. And we tried many times um, to have our first night, but unfortunately it was the lockdown. So in the end, we did it as a radio play. Um, I'm sure I was by far the worst in the cast. They were fantastic, um, particularly some of the judges um, who were obviously frustrated actors, but I was pretty nervous about it. Probably the most nervous I've ever been in my life, actually. Um, just trying to overcome the nerves while um, remembering the lines. You know, what a thing that actors do. It's quite amazing. Um, there was an actor on um, television last week um, reading the whole of um, um, T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, which um, he memorised. I haven't seen it yet, but oh my goodness, you know, what a feat to be able to do that and overcome your nerves at the same time. I do not know how people do it. 
Nor do I know, by the way, how waiters uh, remember what you ordered, but that's another story. <laughs> they write it um, down. Oh, you mean in posh restaurants where they don't? Yeah, 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 yeah. They memorize it all. And it's just, I think, how did you do that? I sit there completely amazed, you know, when you've got a large table full of people. So that's that. The filmmaking. <laughs> the filmmaking started in the water. Someone saw me swimming and said, can I film you? And I said, yes. Um, but can we make this an art film? Um, and she laughed at that. She was a professional photographer. And so we did. Um, and I actually swam in an outdoor pool in the snow. Um, and so you see the snowflakes in the film, which I co-directed with her. And that gave me a taste for making a number of short films for one minute. We entered a competition. We did quite well in it. We were then invited to make a longer film. Um, um, I thought that what would be a really interesting subject would be a history of the universe in eight and a half minutes. So we filmed it and the film was called Rakia. Um, and we were then asked to put it into the Venice Biennale in 2019. And it went in. I was completely amazed at this, you know, because you talk about imposter syndrome. <laughs> and I felt that I was... Um, um, uh, number one imposter in the world. So there I was waltzing around Venice, talking to all these absolutely pretentious artists. Oh my goodness. You know, I could hardly understand a thing they were saying. And um, the uh, some of the curation was absolutely insane. But anyway, <laughs> I learned, you know, I learned some of this stuff, which you know much more about, you know, having worked as you did in the art world for all those years um, when you were the art insurer. But that was huge fun. And I still, um, to this day, think about, you know, what might I film? Um, and then the third thing is the gardening. That's happened gradually. I never really went anywhere near the garden until I um, left the law firm in 2012. Um, but then um, it occurred to me that it would be really interesting, um, after getting the garden right, to start putting artworks into the garden and so I started picking things up from skips. Um, and um, so the garden has got loads and loads of debris in there at the moment, which somehow you can work plants around. Um, and uh, that's really become an obsession. And it's moved into, you know, picking seeds out of plants. And I've been over the last week planting seeds for next summer. And it's just such a wonderful metaphor for life. But you've also so those are finally, three things. Um... You've opened up the garden, right? So it's not when you say debris. I don't mm. uh, it's important people know that you're not like throwing old bathtubs out on the lawn. Oh, no, no. We've got lots of sinks. We collect sinks. We've got about five sinks, including a boy's shower, which we filled up with herbs. Um, and then I've got another one, um, which I've turned into a pond. Um, and um, one of your sons was fascinated with a newt poking out of that last year. Um, um, I would say that at times I've got the national collection of weeds um, because things don't always go right. But, you know, weeds can be beautiful when arranged in the right way. Um, but, yeah, um, I entered into the National Garden Scheme in, um, in July and the house was thrown open to the nation as we have lots of people come in and have a look at the garden and uh, admire the debris. And um, it's happening again next May, um, because one of my ambitions is to try to get year round colour. So I'm aiming at um, a spring garden. So I've just put lots and lots of uh, bulbs into pots. But don't Dad, get me onto that. I'm going to ask you now, um, <laughs> what does success mean to you? What does success mean? I think it mainly means having um, a sense of contentment. Um, and then I think I'm solipsistic enough to judge my contentment by reference to whether people are satisfied with the work. So it is actually an iterative process. If people seem to be happy, um, then that makes me all the happier. But yeah, um, success is more for me about contentment and a sense of being fulfilled and pleasing others. Um, than certainly it is about money, because I'm lucky enough, you know, to have earned a decent amount of money um, to be comfortable. Thank you. You can turn your phone off because I can hear it buzzing away. Um, Not my phone. Oh, maybe it's that's weird. 
It's not mine. It must be your phone. It's not. Anyway. Um, and so because we have lots of coaches here and listening in, what kind of um, question do you ask yourself that you find most useful? Either over the years, have you asked yourself, or now, just in this moment, can you think of that might kind mm -hmm. of help you and help others to mm -hmm. um, make good decisions, let's say? Mm -hmm. um, well, the most useful question is often, what the hell am I doing this for? Um, and that causes you to search yourself. Um, and sometimes that does involve... Um, making a very big decision to stop what you're doing and to see whether you can embrace a change. And that is, you know, the 2012 decision that I was talking about. I actually um, decided on the very day that I turned 60 to hand in my notice. And you were part of that story. We had an absolutely disastrous day of my 60th birthday um, when um, your little brother who'd just come back from a DJing trip to America, had left his passport at the airport. And I don't know whether you remember, but we were traveling up and down the motorway to try and recover this and some other stuff that he'd left at the airport. Um, and I then had um, this wonderful antique Saab car that kept on going wrong, this green Saab. This was the car that was voted um, the 1985 American Auto gay car of choice. It was the car that had featured in many films, like the film Sideways, for example, and I absolutely loved it. The problem was that um, it was growing a garden on the roof. It had a retractable roof um, that um, had attracted a lot of moss. Car kept on going wrong. And as we went up and down the motorway, the, um, the, um, the boot kept on opening. It was just awful. It was a terrible birthday. Uh, even though you tried very hard with your brothers to, you know, find a nice pub and all the rest of it. Anyway, I got back to um, a dear friend, Rhoda, um, who we were going to for supper at the end of the day. I was completely shattered. And as I walked through the door, um, 40 of my best friends greeted me in a surprise party. I was completely shattered. And I came in. And of course, the first cry was speech. So there I am. And I have to work out what to say. And one of the first things that came into my head um, was, um, I'm going to hand in my notice tomorrow. I had been thinking about it. And the next morning, having said this publicly, I thought I have got no choice. So I waited till lunchtime when America came online. I phoned the firm's um, managing partner internationally and I said, I'm leaving. So that was a that was a very big decision. And I've actually forgotten the question. Uh, it was what question do you ask yourself? And actually, that's that a question. Is that question, question yeah, really? no, the ask, existential said, question? Yeah, you said, uh, why am I doing this? And actually, another question Carlos has posted is, is there a piece of advice that you'd love to have given your younger self at the beginning of your work journey? Shall I wrap this up with um, um, looking at the time? <laughs> just some general pieces of advice and the reasons for giving them to, to all people, not can only you re my younger Can you self. rephrase your advice as questions in the spirit of not yeah. giving advice? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 actually, what I'm going to do is <laughs> phrase them as statements and then I'm going to explain them rather than questions. Right. So the first one is, if you feel driven to build a pyramid, only do so up to a point. OK, now you can explain. OK, now I'll explain what that means. Um, in other words, if you want to do anything on a grand scale, then be very careful about doing it by yourself. Um, it's far better to build coalitions and to work with other people. That is difficult um, if you're a coach because you are working for yourself. But it seems to me, actually, you are working very closely together um, with the person you're coaching. This is a dual process. And much more to the point, um, if you are lucky enough to be part of a community like this, you are actually working with a lot of other people. But, you know, it occurs to me, this is the coalition thing. It's been one of the most important things for me 
um, throughout my life, working life, has been building coalitions, working with other people, um, and you know, finding the right sort of network, learning networking opportunities. So that's my first statement. Thanks, Dado. Yeah. Um, my second one would be never use TLAs. <laughs> Go on. Never use TLAs. Which are? We don't like acronyms. They're wanky. What is TLAs? It are, TLAs are three-letter acronyms. <laughs> Fucking funny. <laughs> so um, the point about that is, um, oh, well, I'll tell you another one like that that I work by, which is no matter how much you try to push the envelope, it's it remains stationary. That's, that's also okay. Let's, okay, are we okay so what does that mean what does that mean um that together with tla's actually is all about jargon right i absolutely hate jargon i love um um clarity in documents i'm even prepared to amend other people's documents to try and get them as clear as possible i was very very influenced um when i was young by reading the whole of george orwell who's the most wonderful clear writer in the english language and who writes about writing and speaking as well um so yeah the thing about tlas and pushing the envelopes and all the rest of it is um that um communication is completely central you know trying to work out did you hear my i just had your phone which is the bbc sorry about that news. yes yes that's probably telling me that the prime minister has resigned or can, can uh, I just like put that. this juncture just say to you because I, if I don't say it here and now I'll probably forget here and now. Um, sorry. Uh, yep. So I, having worked in government and you know when I worked at GDS, Government Digital Service, that is for anyone who doesn't isn't familiar with that wanky acronym, three letters. Um, it was all about showing the thing, and that's not mm -hmm. how it sounds. It's um, it's just clear, clear writing. And I couldn't agree with you more. And lots of people here know that I also am a real stickler for copy and uh, punctu punctuation and even fonts, although Kieran is even worse on that front. Um, but it's so nice to hear you say that because it makes me think, gosh, maybe I got that from you. I know I got that from you as well. But, you know, I didn't quite realize how passionate you were about it in the same way as I am. So I just wanted to let you know. Oh, yeah, I do think that that is absolutely central. Um, in working life, in everything you do. Um, you know, when you asked me to do that blog, you reminded me of something that had happened blog to post. you. Blog, blog post. post. Blog post. A blog um, is a met... channel and a post is a thing that lives on the blog. It's a blog I stand, post. I stand corrected by okay. uh, my... I can't my say that to everyone, but I can to my father. Yeah, he thank you very me. much. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, you met someone at a party who had been interviewed by me for... Um, a job as a trainee solicitor and they um said to you that one of the questions that i asked was can you explain to your 12 year old brother or sister what a mortgage is don't tell me but just pretend that i'm your 12 year old brother and just tell me in plain language what a mortgage is um, maybe I asked Natalie that question. Natalie's on on the call. Um, I asked lots of people that question, and it was really interesting how it sorted out those who had an aptitude um, for expression, which is very important in the law, and those who struggled with it and should think about, you know, whether they would be suited to doing some completely different work. Um, so yes, I think that clarity is absolutely central. I need to um, share I need to share with everyone something which you know is tricky for me which is it's something that I've shared before with people here some people here which is that when we were in the car and used to drop me at school and be quite stressed because we would be a few minutes late which would dramatically affect the traffic on the way into uh school and then onto the city where you used to work so it used to really stress you out um <clears throat> and you used to have to be listening to Radio 4 at 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, and so I'd be trying to maybe tell you something or communicate with you. <laughs> and you would say to me, what are the headlines? 
what are the headlines? And I also remember, you've just reminded me, that you would say to me sometimes when I was trying to explain something to you, what are you trying to say? Do you remember that? What, what are you trying to say? Sadly, I do. I mean, it would probably be called parental bullying <laughs> these days. <laughs> but, but it was yeah. such good training because the what are the headlines and what are you trying to say was so good for me in the end. Uh, because mm. it really helped me with my clarity and ability to articulate what I am trying to say, but well, to get clear on what I'm trying to say, but also to get clear on what I'm thinking. And that, mm. this is something that we're trying to help people with in the community, um, you know, and also to be really clear on your audience, right? Um, because mm -hmm. otherwise you can go down a rabbit hole without thinking about, as we call it, being the guide and not the hero. And it's mm -hmm. fine to, to think out loud if you're okay with people. Um, I'm just wrapping up in the four minutes that we have on, on reflection of this conversation. It's fine to, to allow yourself to think out loud. It's very healthy and we learn a lot about ourselves in doing that, as long as we feel safe in the audience with the audience that we have. But there's also something about remembering and respecting your audience and thinking about who you are, uh, who is whose time you are, uh, enjoying, let's say, and that's something I think you've taught me over the years. Mm -hmm. And what it is to to be a showy person, a generous with your creativity, let's say, rather than showy, but generous. Think about the garden, um, all the music. Yeah, creativity is a huge thing that you've left me with, um, and a massive value. Well, thank you for that, Francis. You're saying it publicly, but I hugely appreciate it. Um, shall I just um, just do the final answer to your question about the statements in relation to, you know, to younger people and people? Um, and the, my statement is this, uh, that I observe that dolphins, because we were talking about swimming before, but dolphins are so clever that within a few weeks of captivity, they can train people to stand on the very edge of a pool and throw them fish. And um, what that's about is, of course, the other person's viewpoint. That is um, stepping inside, um, looking at things from a completely different viewpoint. In this case, you know, how does the world look like from a dolphin's viewpoint? Does a dolphin think that they've actually trained the humans to come to the edge of the pool? Is it some vast, clever plan um, that dolphins are able to communicate to one another? Well, the thing about this is central to me has been to try and get inside the mind of whoever I was interacting with or whichever group of people um, and to cause that to change my output. Uh, that's you know, a very, very hard thing to do because you've got to at times suppress your own emotion. Um, but um, I think it's absolutely essential. And that would be my answer, really, to the question that was put before. I can't remember who put it in the chat line, but that, that's the answer. So it feels like there's a, a maturing involved in communication when you can be putting out and saying what it is that's in response to, or at least in mind of your audience, as opposed to just uh, well, not only primarily, but that's no, I mean, it comes yeah, back to um, you know, the explanation to a, a 12 year old or a six year old, and as um, someone has pointed out on the chat line, um, correctly, um, if you can't explain it to a six year old, you don't understand it yourself. That is absolutely true. I'm glad you guys agree. Um, this has been amazing. And Anya, you are a love as usual. Can you start a podcast and record more conversations between two of you, between the two of you, please? This is so good. Um, thank you for the invitation. I, A, take it as a compliment. Um, B, also I'm really pleased that I invited Dad onto the Marketing Masterclass. Not least because not only has it been a personal indulgence, but I think there have actually been some nuggets of gold from you, Dad, that relate to marketing as a coach. <laughs> so it is uh, relevant to our audience. Um, I can see why a podcast with you would be really uh, valuable to me. 
I couldn't possibly say if it will be of any value to you or anyone else. But um, I do appreciate the invitation, Anya. Um, perhaps Dad and I will think about it. We're off to the Cotswolds for a week on Saturday together. So we'll we'll think about it, won't we, Dad, in the week? We haven't talked at all we about family, will. which I found really, really refreshing. Because the other thing is, how on earth do you navigate all of this shit when you've got children? But I think that's probably enough to say on that. And I hope people have... Um, I hope I hope people feel that they've been given permission to do what they want and then think about how they might tell the story to themselves on, re on retrospect or at the time about how it makes perfect sense for themselves and perfect sense for others. So, Thank you very much, Francis, for this. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm looking forward next week with... Um, with your boys to changing lots and lots of batteries on their toys. But, you know, um, you've got to look at the positives as well as the negatives. Which are, oh, yeah, okay. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, dear. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. And my sense of, sense of humour is, is from my father as well. So. All right. Thank you all. We will see you when Simon is back for another Marketing Masterclass. Um, follow us on Crowdcast for more of this kind of informative chat. And uh, we appreciate your feedback here. Thank you. And also elsewhere. And obviously, please do join the community. If I was more technically able, I would have done what Simon always does, which is have a join the community button on Crowdcast, which I have forgotten to do and probably wouldn't be able to anyway. So please do find us on whichever social channel is your uh, channel of preference and there you should find a link to check us out more and lots of love thank you dad very much and thank you, thank you. bye